Soldiers of the Press. This week, Atlantic Convoy. Let her go, Mac. Last sling load coming aboard. Take her away. Is you with that stuff, boys? All right, bosun. We close the hatches. Turn to the gangs, fore and aft. Aye, aye, sir. Dog down all hatches. Gangs, fore and aft, turn to. Hatches being secured, sir. Standing by to cast off. Fine, McDonald. We have clearance for 1630. We'll be underway in half an hour, engineer. Right, sir. Anytime you say. So at an East Coast port, another ship loaded with life for American troops and their allies, with death for the Axis, moves out to cast anchor in the harbor. She is ready now for the formation of her convoy and the boarding of her passengers. Among them are two United Press correspondents. Robert Vermillion and R.W. Richards. Both are bound for assignments in UP's London Bureau. This is their story of their voyage through the sea lanes of the Atlantic where Hitler's wolf packs of submarines seek to curb the flow of the weapons of war to Britain, Russia, North Africa. An eyewitness account by correspondents Robert Vermillion and R.W. Richards of one convoy's battle with the U-boats. A vivid picture from their UP dispatches of the sort of thing that happens unchronicled almost any day or night somewhere in the Atlantic. Have passports and credentials ready. Have them in order for the immigration officer. Have them ready, please. It's all right, sir. You're next. Bound for the United Kingdom? <laughs> yes, sir. May I see your credentials, please? Here they are, sir. All in order, I believe. Uh, let's see now. You're Robert Vermillion? That's right. <laughs> I know you wouldn't believe it from the passport photograph, but I'm Vermillion of United Press, bound for London. London? Oh, wherever else they see fit to set you down, sir. Okay, you're all set. All right, you're next. There you are, sir. Robert William Richards, United Press correspondent, also bound for London. Uh huh. Passport in order, credentials in order, exit permit in order. Okay, you're both for launch D. Thank I'll you. be right with you. All right, now, who's next? Right here, sir. James Judson for Cairo. Via London. Passengers for ship 2049, launch D is standing by on Pier 4. The sun launch had just D given way to twilight as we set out from the dock for ship 2049. The faces of our fellow passengers were shadowed, and their voices were hushed in the strangeness of this departure for an uncertain voyage. There were six women and 15 men, including ourselves. Several looked as if they had made the convoy trip before, but for the majority, this was a maiden voyage. And most of us still cherished peacetime visions of an Atlantic crossing. I used to think it'd be the Queen Mary and nothing that'd take me to London, with a band playing and a few thousand people to see me off. Yeah, personally, I'm going to miss the champagne. Well, Bob, here's our ocean liner. How's she look? Oh, I'll take their word, she'll make it across, but at first glance, I'm convinced she's no luxury liner. You can say that again. We scrambled up a ladder to border, and two hours later, in the pitch darkness of a cloudy night, we slipped out of the harbor to join our convoy. Next morning, ship 2049 had become one of a great parade of freighters, tankers, and naval escort vessels that spread over a wide expanse of sea. It was an inspiring sight, and the busy little corvettes and destroyers nosing ahead, at the flanks, and behind our convoy gave us a comforting feeling of security. For several days, we pushed ahead without incident. Nights, we would gather in the bar to while away time. Well, this business of sitting around in a blacked-out ship every night is getting on my nerves. Mine, too. Mm. No, I can't help it, but I, I keep feeling as if we're sitting on a powder keg. Maybe we are. Anybody know what cargoes we're carrying? I don't. Know. I don't. One of the sailors told me a destroyer mm. sighted a sub this afternoon. That's right. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. We must be just about... Come on, cut it out. Huh? I think we'd all feel better over a few hands of poker. Yeah, I think you're right, Richards. I'll trot out that spongy deck of cards and let's get going. <laughs> okay, let's make this a real poker player's hand. Five card draw, nothing wild. All right, everybody, come on, man. Yeah, on, 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 on. Okay, everybody in. Now, uh, look, Richards, couldn't you manage to give me openers at least? 
kind of cards I've been getting lately, Hitler wouldn't deal to Mussolini. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought I heard something. An explosion out there somewhere. I didn't hear anything. Well, come on, come on, Richard. Steal. Let's get going. You know, it's just too quiet this trip to suit me. Last time yeah, I... Yeah, I know. Last time across, you were torpedoed. Look, can't we drop the gloom and play the hand? Anybody got openers? By me. Sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Well, this is a fine assortment of cardboard. I pass. I'll open for two bits. What do you think of that, openers? Lucky you. <laughs> they just bumped one. They what? They bumped one. A torpedo just hit one of the ships. Oh, I see. Just my luck, and it's the first good hand I've had this trip. Okay, everybody put on your life jackets. We'll go into the salon. You'll be more comfortable there. Everybody leave your hands just where they are. And there go the depth charges. We sat on the floor of the salon because it's the most comfortable place aboard a constantly pitching ship. We sweated because we were scared and because all of us had put on as many warm clothes as we had, just in case. There was a submarine out there somewhere in the darkness. A submarine and at least one sinking ship. The depth charges of our escort vessels were churning the ocean in search of the marauders and every blast shook our ship. There was a U-boat out there. And if you've never felt the impact of a torpedo, each depth charge might as well be it. And if you've never heard a depth charge before, you don't know just how close to your ship they're hunting that sound. Sounds like those charges are moving closer. Any idea how far off they're dropping those ash cans? Oh, I'd guess something like 1,500 yards off our port bow. The time I was torpedoed, the sub came up between us and our escort. The torpedo hit us amidships. And our ship was down within within ten minutes. That's a comforting thought. Sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to make it worse. Just can't help thinking about it, though. Sure, I know. I'm just jumpy. Forget it. Matter of fact, uh, uh, we ought to be pretty safe. After all, the odds should be against my having to swim in this damn ocean twice in two trips out, huh? <laughs> yeah, that makes me feel very safe. Glad to have you aboard, Judson. Oh, I wish I was in Kansas where, where it's dry. dry. Oh, I wish I was in Kansas where it's dry. For I've got an awful notion to watch water. We huddled together in the ship's salon until nearly dawn, singing to keep our spirits up and tired, but too tense to sleep. It was nearly 4 a.m. before the captain sent down word that the danger had passed and that we could go to our cabins. We managed a little sleep after that, but awakened to find that the battle had only begun. At midday, the dull boom of the depth charges began again. That sounded sort of close, Bob. Now, here we go again. Let's go topside. I'm right with you. We raced up on deck. In the brilliant sunlight, the sub's victim lay nearby. Smoke was pouring from the side. We stood silent beside the bosun of our ship. Across the narrow expanse of water that separated us from the sinking ship, we could hear her crew preparing to abandon ship and we could see them swinging lifeboats over the side. Man's lifeboat stations! Man's lifeboat stations! Man's on ship! Man's on ship! Number one boat! Lower away! Number two boat! Lower away! Well, I hope the Corvettes nail that damned sub. Boy, he didn't miss having our number very much, did he? No, sir. Bloody you boat came into the very middle of the convoy. That's pretty nervy, you know. Looks like we got a pack of them following us. And that's the way it went, day and night. Alarm after alarm. Sometimes no subs were sighted. Frequently, our convoy escaped unharmed. But it was wearing on the nerves. The weary crew of our ship had been almost sleepless since the attacks began. And several passengers volunteered to stand relief watches. That's how I happened to be topside the morning we nearly got ours. How are you feeling, Vermillion? These early hours agree with you? Well, as a kid, I used to get up this early to hunt ducks. Our game's bigger here, so I guess I can keep awake. Uh, what time is it, anyhow? Nearly two bells. Five o'clock. One hour of your watch is done. Barometer's falling slightly, sir. Diane will fall normal. Wind force four and rising. Looks like we may be in for a blow. Very well, Mr. McDonald. Well, Vermillion, if the sea gets rough enough, the subs won't be so active. <laughs> And I'll probably be seasick. But I vote for that heavy blow. Hey. Hey, what's that? That's a starship. A destroyer off our starboard quarters got something. We strained our eyes in the half-light, trying to see the cause of the alarm. 
The gong alerted the ship and the gun crews scrambled to their stations. Suddenly, the tank of the port opened fire directly at us. Orange tracers bounced across the water directly ahead of us. Some ricocheted against the size of our ship. Hey, what in the hell? Fire, Peters! Our right runner! Train those guns to starboard! Gun position! Three to bridge! Tell the yard! Peter, wake the starboard! Come on! Correction! Two torpedo tracks off starboard! Go! Follow them! Follow them! I could see them now. Two thin white wakes in the gray sea. They were less than 1,000 yards off, bearing straight for us. I watched in horrified fascination as the tanker fired across our bow and our own gun splattered the water with lead in an attempt to explode the deadly tinfish before they caught us. Our ship seemed to be turning in slow motion. Suddenly, the ocean erupted into a great geyser of water. I was half thrown to the deck. My first impression was that we'd been hit. They got one! The tanker got one! Second torpedo, clear of port bound. Gun bearing, port, get it! I could have spit on that one as it went by. That second torpedo missed us by inches, but our guns were still pouring a stream of tracers after it. For now it was the tank of the port that was threatened. Get her! You got her! Nice shooting! Oh, it was too close for comfort. I still got to pinch myself to believe I'm all in one piece. Well, all right, Vermillion. Now it's the sub that'll have to worry. That Corvette's run up the black flag. Yeah, what's that mean? Direct contact with the submarine. Brother, I don't envy the guys aboard that pig boat. Great fountains of water shot skyward as the little ship started laying her pattern of death charges. It was a satisfying sight to watch from the bridge. We knew the U-boat was diving now, racing for its life. But the Corvette couldn't be shaken this time. I remembered how we felt that first night in the salon, boxed in and waiting. Now it was some Oberleutnant and his Unter-Nazis who were quaking in their ersatz boots and getting a taste of their own medicine. Were no more submarine attacks after that. United Press correspondents are covering the day-to-day developments of war on land, at sea, and in the skies. They face daily risks beside our fighting men to gather the colorful stories behind the communiques. Be sure to listen to the next of these programs describing the experiences of these men of UP. And meanwhile, listen for United Press news on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news.